A few months ago, Russia started sending more and more troops to this border. It's this massive border between Ukraine and Russia. They said they were doing a military exercise, but the rest of the world was like, yeah, we totally believe you, Russia. Pfft. It's hard to watch this guy because of his style, you know? I mean, he makes he makes good maps. I, I have to I have to admit that I saw his video on making maps, but not politics. <laughs> I mean, just like every, everything with that part is uh, really annoying because he acts like Russia sending troops to the border of Ukraine. I mean, he says the, this big border between Russia and Ukraine and he doesn't think, oh, well, that's also Russia's border as well. And it's on its own on, on its own territory, you know, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey comrades and welcome to the Revolution Report's first reaction video. Uh, I, at the beginning of making this channel, didn't really think I was going to be doing reaction videos, but I just saw this video come out by this guy, Johnny Harris, who has over 2 million subscribers, and I just, I, I couldn't not do a reaction to it. Uh, right here, it's not just me, but it's also uh, Noor, a member of the Revolution Report Politburo. I mean, this this guy, uh, his channel is, first of all, his presentation style is just like so cringe it just like hurts for me to watch and on top of that i mean if that was just if it was, if it was just that i'd be like okay you know the, you know there's no there's no reason to pick on this guy but on top of that he's doing this video about it's called the real reason putin is preparing for war in ukraine and as someone who uh, is confident that they're an expert in this field i can tell you that this uh, video is just complete b and we I mean, I watched the whole 22-minute video. Um, it would take too long to do an entire re a reaction video to the entire 22 minutes, so we just picked basically the most ridiculous moments uh, to watch and uh, react here uh, for you with uh, Noor as well. Noor, do you want to say anything before we start? Let's, let's press the cringe button and let's go. All right, let's do it. Because of Russia's aggressive behavior coming in and setting up 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine, the entire summit turned into a whole WTF Russia, what are you doing on the border of Ukraine meeting. Before the meeting, Putin comes out and says, listen, I have some demands for the West. And everyone's like, uh, okay, Russia, what are your demands? You know, we have like COVID-19 right now and like that's like surging, so like, we don't need your like bluster about what your demands are. And Putin's like, no, here's my list of demands. Putin's demands for the summit were this. Number one, that NATO, which is this big military alliance between US, Canada, and Europe, stop expanding, meaning they don't let any new members in, okay? So, so Russia's like, no more new members to your like cool military club that I don't like. Your cool military club that I don't like. And what the, what the hell? I mean, he's calling these demands. Russia called them proposals. Proposals for security guarantees. What is this demand? I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that he didn't, he didn't use the Russian accent. Like, uh, look, here are my demands. Like, like, and, and like the cool military club you, you calling cool is not so very cool to the people of Serbia and Libya. Right, it's a, an imperialist military alliance. He's acting like it's like a cool military club. I mean, this is just, I mean, from, from the beginning of the video, it's set up to be anti-Russia. You know, it's set, up, it's set up to make NATO look like these, like, you know, we're just minding our own business, you know, smoking cigars, drinking scotch at our cool military club. And Russia just has some sort of problem with us making demands. You know, we don't understand. Uh, Russia also has the COVID-19 cases that are surging right now. The West is not the only one that has COVID. Right. And there are other problems in the world right now other than COVID. <laughs> like the possibility of nuclear war that this video is supposed to be addressing. You can't have any more members. Number two that NATO withdraw all of their troops from anywhere in Eastern Europe. Basically, Putin is saying, I can veto any military cooperation or troops going between countries that have to do with Eastern Europe, the place that used to be the Soviet Union, okay? And number three, Putin demands that America vow not to protect its allies in Eastern Europe with nuclear weapons. 
LOL, said all of the other countries. You're literally nuts, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I really, <laughs> I hate this L. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't even know, I mean, where to begin with these things. I mean, with this part of the video, to begin with his very strange presentation of this stuff, or the fact that it's not so ridiculous to say that, you know, a hostile military alliance should take all its troops out from right against its border, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fact that he showed the, the map in the beginning, that's such a big map of the NATO alliance that de de depicted the NATO alliance in the blue blue side, the, the size of that map should tell you how, how it has increased right at, how it has gone right at Russia's borders after the Soviet yeah. Union collapsed. I mean, if that doesn't tell you who's moving forward, who's who's the aggressor here, I don't know what will. Yeah, I know. It's almost it's almost like uh, it was a satirically made map. You know, there's that you know there's that meme you can Google on the internet where it says, "Why does Russia or China or Iran put their country so close to our military bases?" It's like literally that. Basically, base <laughs> that map basically contradicts his own position. Yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous. These are the most ridiculous demands ever. But there he is, Putin, with these demands, these very, very aggressive demands. And he sort of is implying that if his demands aren't met, he's going to invade Ukraine. Okay, this part, <laughs> where where is he implying that he's going to invade Ukraine? This is this is the weirdest thing. I don't understand where, where like, uh, he gets this idea that Putin is implying he's going to invade Ukraine. The Russian government... Vladimir Putin, the foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, all of they all they've said is that we're not going to invade Ukraine. The only thing they've said in relation militarily to the people of Donbass is that if Ukraine attacks them, then Russia will step in to defend uh, Russian people in that region. That's the only thing they've ever said. They've never hinted to any type of invasion. This all just started when actually, uh, you know, several months ago, the, the Ukrainian government started saying that Russia is planning for some sort of invasion and they didn't give any evidence and European the European intelligence communities were saying well we don't have any evidence that Russia is planning to invade and then all of a sudden Washington is like no no trust the Ukrainians they're planning to invade and then they all got on this bandwagon yeah I mean on and the fact that the Russians are making the statement that they're going to protect that, that that they will take action only when the their citizens are in, in Donbass are attacked because there's so many Russian passport holders that live in that region. There's about 720,000 uh, Russian passport holders that live in that region. And if, 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 if a force, if, if an outside force attacks Russian passport holders, I think it's justified that Russia takes some steps to protect its passport holders. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, you know, like you said, they're passport holders and the people there, I mean, they don't speak Ukrainian. They actually speak Russian. I've been there a million times. The people in Donetsk and Lugansk, they speak Russian there. They have, they consider themselves Russian. They have Russian customs that are, you know, not the same as the people in, uh, in Kiev, you know, actually the, the only, the only similarity they really have is that they have uh, the same accent when they speak Russian, they don't pronounce their G's properly. Well, okay, properly, but they don't pronounce their G's in the same way that Russians pronounce them in uh, in Moscow or uh, or any other Russian Federation city. That's the only difference. I mean, it doesn't work like this. This is not how international relations work. You don't just show up and say like, you. Can, I'm not going to allow other countries to join your alliance because it makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> we need a reaction of this. You need to pause this. <laughs> That's not even what happened. That's the funniest thing. I mean, Ru Russia in mid-December sent proposals. They were called proposals. You can look them up on the internet. They're published on the Russian Foreign Ministry's website. Proposals for security guarantees, mutual security guarantees between Russia and the United States so that war doesn't happen. And Washington from the beginning is like, no, this is just, uh, this is something we can't do for you. Uh, the the n guaranteeing that NATO isn't going to expand farther east, even though this is something that was promised to Russia back in 1990, actually, but it was promised to the Soviet Union. And, you know, now American officials are saying, well, this is like an informal promise and everything. So, you know, we didn't really mean it back then when uh, we were trying to get on your good side, when Mikhail Gorbachev, the traitor to socialism, was in power. You know, now they're backtracking. <laughs> The, the, the point he just made is the very reason why NATO was founded. Yeah. He, the, so, the, the West feared that more the so-called Western Europe governments would, would turn communist and would turn socialist and a Soviet Union 
would attack them, then just like what they're saying, how they're saying now that Russia would attack Ukraine. This is why the West formed NATO to prevent more countries from turning socialist. Yeah, yeah. And it's important to note that uh, the, the NATO was formed for that reason, because there was a real threat of Western European countries becoming socialist, not because the Soviet Union was trying to invade them or anything, but because actually there were popular uprisings, specifically in France, we can look at. There were, up, there were communist uprising in, uh, uprisings in France that Charles de Gaulle, the World War II hero who came to power after World War II, had to use you know, military strength to put down people that were calling for a communist government in France. You know, that was the reality, and that's why NATO was formed first. The only guy, the only person saying LOL is this guy. No one else is saying LOL. I know, because it's, really, it's, it's not really funny, I mean, if you, if you think about it. Uh, if, I mean, when you look at it from Russia's perspective, or just come here and talk to Russian people and learn Russian history, I mean, you understand that it's kind of weird that uh, the West would be saying that Russia is the, the aggressor here when, it's enti when the country is entirely surrounded by its enemies. So it's after World War II, it's like the 50s, 60s, 70s, and NATO was formed. The okay, uh, first of all, NATO was not... <laughs> NATO was not formed in the 50s, 60s, or 70s. They don't, they, NATO was formed in 1949. So first of all, I mean, obviously this guy doesn't know uh, his history that well. His graphic edi editing skills are, are definitely uh, very up there, but I mean, that seems like Wikipedia historian to me. <laughs> this was a military alliance between all of these countries that was meant to sort of deter the Soviet Union from expanding and taking over the world. You just made that point. Just <laughs> made that point. And I think, I think another thing that's important to note is that NATO was, you know, it's called a, milita a military alliance, but it was never like a sort of defensive pact ever or to begin with, you know? It was always a sort of, you know, a aggressive military alliance. It was formed, let's remember, before the Warsaw Pact uh, was formed in response to it. Because the socialist countries were like, well, they're, they're uniting their armies. We need to make sure that we can defend ourselves because this huge hostile military alliance is forming on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And now the Warsaw Pact's even gone. What's the point of NATO? You know, it's just an organization for, to protect the interests of Western capitalists. Amazing quote from 2005 where Putin is giving the State of the Union like address where Putin declares the collapse of the Soviet Union, quote, the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. And as for the Russian people, it became a genuine tragedy. Tens of millions of fellow citizens and countrymen found themselves beyond the fringes of Russian territory. Do you see how he frames this? The Soviet Union were all one people in his mind. And after it collapsed, all of these people who were a part of the motherland were now outside of the fringes or the boundaries of Russian territory. First off, fact check. Greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Like, do you remember what else happened in the 20th century, Vladimir? I don't know, maybe he understands or maybe he doesn't, but uh, the fall, the collapse of the USSR was absolutely horrific for people who lived in the USSR. I mean, we, we've done uh, many, many videos on it. You can watch our video on perestroika, you can watch our uh, Soviet, our interviews with people who lived in the USSR, the 1990s. I mean, there were gangsters running around killing people. You know, the the Western capitalists were selling all of the economy off for pennies on the dollar of their worth to the West. Um, I mean, there was like child sex trafficking. Cra it was it was a crazy time. It was completely traumatic for the people uh, who lived there. So, I mean, at you know, I could see what the point he's making about like maybe there, maybe there could have one of the other catastrophes of the of uh, the 20th century might be considered worse. But I mean, for Russians and you know probably a, tons of people in other Soviet republics, I mean, the two greatest catastrophes are World War II and the collapse of the USSR. The and they World both involve the Soviet Union. And they both involve the Soviet Union. Yeah, the Soviet Union getting attacked by outside forces basically, and. Another thing I want to talk about in this part is that he kind of tries to make this point where, uh, you know, in, in that document that Putin wrote that, uh, you know, he expressed that he was upset about the fact that after the fall of the USSR, um, you know, tons of his countrymen were left stranded beyond the fringes of Russian territory. He kind, he kind of tries to make this point that because the Soviet people were considered one people 
when the Soviet Union still existed, then that means he just considers everyone who lived in the, in the Soviet Union Russians, and that he's trying to like infringe on the, on the national sovereignty of other nations. But that's not even what he's saying in that document. What he's, you know, this, he's talking about a problem that uh, was serious after the fall of the USSR. He's talking about the fact that you know, when the USSR still existed, travel between the former Soviet republics was free. I mean, there was like no basically border control between the different republics. So there were uh, Russians in Belarus and Ukraine and Lithuania and Latvia and Kazakhstan. And there were like people from uh, Uzbekistan in, I don't know, Latvia, you know, like all of the people from the Soviet republics were in other Soviet republics as well. And when the USSR collapsed and all of these places became independent states, they had to get their own uh, passports, their own statehood, you know, hard borders were set up, and this created a serious problem for all the Russians that were living abroad and, you know, were expecting, uh, you know, an easy return to their homeland, and all of a sudden a hard border is set up, and what are they going to do with their Soviet passport, you know, that was not uh, a Russian passport during, during the, when the USSR still existed. I mean, there was even, there's even the story of that cosmonaut who was on the International Space Station when the Soviet Union collapsed. And they, he was, I, I'm pretty sure he was the person who spent the longest time on the International Space Station. I'm not sure of that, but I think I remember reading that somewhere. But I know for a fact he was there a lot longer than he was supposed to be because they had bureaucratic issues with the fact that the USSR collapsed as he was in space. So he was like trying to, you know, get home, but he couldn't because the entire government had changed while he was up there in space. I mean, he's, he's, he's highlighting the fact. I mean, sure, sure, there, there was nationalism in the republics, but, um, but they all called themselves Soviet citizens. That's what they called them. I mean, yeah. the Soviet Union made great strides in making, making, making that happen. It, they they highlighted the importance of cultures, the Soviet culture, the common culture. I mean, if you if you talk about it um, in a sense that uh, everyone in the West says uh, that it was the Russians, 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 nobody really mentions other republics because it it was. But in the Soviet Union, it was a collective Soviet republic. We are the Soviets. That's what they call them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it didn't have to do with only Russians. I mean, you know, there were Kazakhs, Uzbeks. Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, that, you know, they all contributed to the same things that Russians contributed to in, the U in building socialism in the USSR. Putin's worry about the collapse of this one people starts to get way worse when the West, his enemy, starts showing up to his neighborhood to all these ex-Soviet countries that are now independent. The West starts selling their ideology of democracy and capitalism and inviting them to join their military alliance called NATO. And guess what? These countries are totally buying it. They're just an inviting, how graciously inviting these Eastern European now independent countries into their military lines. I mean, <laughs> it's just like a joke. I mean, th these countries after the fall of the USSR, like these uh, hyper nationalists came to power. And, you know, I mean, I guess people will use the argument that these that revolutions happened in these places and uh, you know, there was like a popular overthrow of the government, but there's not even that can't even be demonstrated, first of all. And second of all, you know, political allegiances in political systems, they 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 switch so quickly. I mean, in the United States, it's a perfect example, like four years ago or, you know, like during the last presidential administration of Trump, you know, he was voted in uh, in, against uh, Hillary Clinton. I mean, most people were thinking Hillary Clinton is evil and Donald Trump, oh, he's going to, uh, you know, save America. All, even, even people who were not Republicans, but they were just uh, disenfranchised with the political system and they were like, well, Donald Trump's uh, less bad than Hillary Clinton, so we're going to give him a chance. And now four years later, uh, this, the script has changed and, you know, they support Biden and now they hate Biden again. You know, like these sort of parliamentary... Uh, fluctuations change so quickly. I mean, we should really be looking at the fact that 
there are two, basically two main forces in all of these Eastern European countries. They're, whether they be communist, uh, liberal, whatever, there's people who basically fall into two camps. People who, you know, are pro-EU, pro-NATO, and people who are against that and anti-imperialist and, you know, feel that Russia has a point when it wants to defend its uh, national sovereignty. And by saying that these countries were just invited into this, you know, these new independent countries were just invited into this military alliance is kind of disingenuous. Uh, the, people, the people who came to power in those Eastern European countries were nationalists. That's the whole reason they came to power through undemocratic means in the, uh, in the, the former USSR. Of course they're going to join NATO because the countries are run by governments that are hyper-nationalist. I mean, it has nothing to do with what people in those countries actually wanted. The, the amount of propaganda that was flowing in into these countries in, in the year 1989, I mean, the United States has, had set up the, the radio stations right outside, the, the, right at the border of these countries to specifically um, uh, get over the radio jamming that the, that the Soviet Union was doing because they were basically flowing in propaganda. You see that news agency that uh, the Radio Free Europe, the Radio Liberty, that was funded by the United States, still, still is. It was formed specifically for the purpose of instilling this nasty, hyper-nationalist spirit into these people, which ultimately led to the overthrowing of the, of the, of the socialist governments. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another thing to point out is that this also came at a time that uh, when Moscow, when the Communist Party and the Soviet Union was basically dropping its weapons and surrendering in the ideological war against the West. And all the while, the West was just basically laughing. I mean, you had Gorbachev, who was, it was really pathetic, you know, in power, thinking, why can't we all just get along? You know, we're not going to defend socialist governments when they're under threat in Eastern Europe. And you had on the other side, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, and they're just like, they're having, they're having a party. Yeah, exactly. They were, they were having a great time because Gorbachev was saying, yeah, we should have nuclear disarmament. And he's signing these uh, agreements that are basically stripping the Soviet Union of its nuclear rights and letting the West do whatever it wants with theirs. I remember uh, Molotov, the, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, Vyacheslav Molotov, um, he said that when Khrushchev came to power, the struggle for the struggle against imperialism became the struggle for peaceful existence. So you see how he quotes it there. He puts it perfectly, and it it increased under Gorbachev. They were not fighting against imperialism. They were they were just uh, doing everything they can for peaceful coexistence. They can these two systems can't exist together. They, they should exist together, but capitalists capitalists are not satisfied. They they will not rest until socialism is destroyed. Yeah, I mean, th yeah, you're you're in entirely right, Nor, because I mean, peaceful coexistence. This ideology, what we can see now in form, it was peace. It was uh, you know calling for peace between countries, but in content, it was a defeatist idea. I mean, what. What, what we can see now more than ever is that Washington is not interested in peace. They're interested in world domination and they're not going to negotiate or stop to d stop doing anything to, uh, to, achieve the, to, not, uh, to achieve that goal. They're, gonna, they're just going to do whatever it takes to take control of Russia's markets, smash China and keep its uh, monopoly uh, or hegemony of world, world geopolitical power. That's the, that's the problem. It's, it's like a... I mean, Washington has acted like a wild predator for decades already. And people who, don't, who still don't see that, I mean, they got to get out from under the rock they're living. He's effectively silenced anyone who can challenge him. Any institution, any court, or any political rival have all been silenced. <laughs> I love how Navalny is the only, it, he says all political opposition has been silenced. And the, and the only thing he has is a headline about Navalny. I mean, the, the West doesn't even talk about Navalny anymore. <laughs> no, they, don't even, they don't even talk about him. Even, Alexei Navalny is the Juan Guaido of, of Russia. <laughs> they, don't talk, they don't talk about Juan Guaido anywhere, anymore, and they don't talk about Alexei Navalny anymore. What's sad, he was their guy in, the, in Russia. I mean, he was trained at Yale University with other people who 
went off to do organize color revolutions in places in in places like uh, Tunisia during Arab Spring. I mean, he was learning how to be a color revolutionary right alongside those people in the United States, and he organized uh, his fund for the fighting of corruption and whatever in Russia. And now he we're not even hearing about him at all, like you said, Noor. And he was just recently actually put on a list of terrorists and extremists, and the West is doing nothing to help him. He talks about as if Navalny is the only opposition that was present. There's so many political parties that are present. The, the communists, for example, the second yeah. largest party, they made huge gains in the recent election. If yeah. everything was controlled by Putin, how would the communists make gains? They are becoming hugely popular, and they oppose stuff that he does. For Take, for example, the retirement age. And... Um, uh, I mean, talk about persecution. Ukraine's the one that's doing the persecution. Its former presidents are being persecuted. Poroshenko is being persecuted. Medvedchuk is being persecuted. Talk about persecution. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want. I wanted to say the same thing. I mean, exactly. What about the Communist Party? It's not. Like, it's not controlled opposition, uh, in in the way that a lot of people think. That's just like you know, for show. I mean, the uh, Putin and the United Russia Party don't really like the Communist Party. They're kind of like. Uh, I would say, you know, they're in a sort of, uh, you know, patriotic alliance. None, ne neither of them are going to be, you know, s getting money or support from the West to overthrow the government and have a color revolution like Navalny was uh, planning on doing. But, you know, communists have a different program than uh, Putin's government. You know, they want to restore communism. They want, they want to uh, make a sort of socialism in the 21st century. And... They're a serious opposition party, and they made they made the the biggest gains in the last parliamentary elections since the 1990s. I mean, this is just like this is a a great example of like someone who probably spends a lot of time researching things and being on the internet. And I'm you know I'm sure he knows a lot about certain things. I mean, but this is like a baby analysis, like a baby a Western baby analysis of what's going on in Russia right now and what its relation, uh, what its relationship is with the rest of the world. And I mean, the first thing you can see in this video that should tell you that is the fact that he's only using Western media, you know, he's only using clips from Western media that's hyping up this hysteria around some sort of plans for a Russian invasion that nobody can actually evidence. If the country itself is saying that they're going to, they're not going to invade Ukraine then why are you like you 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 all it's almost like you you saying no no as I say I'm, I'm gonna I'm saying I'm not gonna invade Ukraine and you say no you will invade Ukraine how, how does this logic work yeah I know it's like do you want me to <laughs> it's been decades since the Soviet Union fell but as Putin gains more power he still sees the region through the lens of the old Cold War Soviet Slavic Empire view he sees this region as one big block that has been torn apart by outside forces. I, I want to start with the fact that he thinks that Putin has a Cold War ideology because they're like, you know, like he's stuck in a Cold War ideology because it's actually the West that's like that. I mean, the West has set up again this dichotomy of Russia and itself. And, you know, there, I mean, when I was in America, people thought that Putin was a communist. A lot of people didn't even know the Soviet Union still didn't exist anymore. You know, it's, it's the United States is living in the Cold War mentality. I mean, Russia, the Russian government's line for the longest time has been, let's, uh, you, you know, it's a capitalist government in Russia. They've been saying, let's, let's, uh, work to, let's work together with the West to try like to do business on equal terms. And the Western governments are just saying, no, you know, you're our enemy and we're gonna take you by force. So Russia's government that calls People like Joe Biden, uh, the, Russia's Western partners, that's not a Cold War ideology. The Cold War ideology is saying that Russia's going to invade Ukraine without any evidence. And another thing is that, you know, he talks about, uh, he says that Putin believes that uh, the whole region is one big block that's being torn apart by Western forces as if it's some sort of uh, schizophrenic idea. But meanwhile, I mean, the place is being torn apart by Western forces, by outside forces. I mean, Ukraine didn't, I mean, the Ukraine was basically uh, over, the government was overthrown in 2014 by a fascist-backed coup. 
you know, and that's, 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 that, 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 that's how all these tensions began. Yeah, it was and it was backed by the United States. You know, United States military advisors have been there since 2014. Uh, the United States and the UK have been sending weapons to Ukraine far before this controversy about a, a Russian invasion started. I mean, this is this is the West. The West has caused this, not Russia. Yeah, giving unconditional support to the new government, which was like super imperialist, backed by neo-fascists, and there's even documented evidence that neo-Nazi militias were holding like events, like uh, like uh, meet and greets at the U.S. embassy. You know, it's crazy. And all these elements have been now been assimilated into the Ukrainian army. That's that's an important thing to note that these uh, these neo neo-Nazi neo-fascist militias that. Uh, backed up the current government when it was coming to power in 2014. They were just militias, but now they're they've been integrated into the National Guard. And Washington did something very interesting in 2018. They before that had not banned funding or training or arming of neo-fascist militias in Ukraine. And then in 2018 they did. But you know what's also interesting? In 2018 that was also the year where a lot of these neo-Nazi militias were integrated into the National Guard of the country which does receive weapons and arms and money from the U.S. government. And over the years, Ukraine has been drifting west. It hasn't joined NATO yet, but more and more it's been electing pro-Western presidents. It's been flirting with membership in NATO. It's becoming less and less attached to the Russian heritage. Okay. <laughs> electing, electing. Yeah, electing, yeah. Like, and, and, and he's talking about like Ukraine as if all of what he says is supposed uh, if as if all of what he says is ukraine is voting for these presidents half of, U half of ukraine is independent wanted to be independent and two of two of the republics are independent and while while two well protests in two or three were su suppressed by the ukrainian secret service yeah, and yeah. he says all of ukraine wants to be pro-western mm. News flash: Ukraine only started flirting with NATO membership and trying to be close to the EU after the West sponsored a neo-fascist-backed coup in the country that cut it in half, that, that basically forced the, the people who were pro-Russia in the country to, to declare independence and say, we don't want anything to do with this government. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the country of Ukraine right now that excludes Crimea and uh, the, Don, the Donbass People's Republics yeah, they're flirting with NATO membership because they basically kicked out all of the people who disagreed with them. You know, they pushed them all away to the po to 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 the point of civil war. And then and then some of them they even invaded, like in Kharkov and Odessa. Those places declared independence as well. And like you said, Nor, they just sent in the military and and completely shut them down. And more than half of Ukrainians say that they'd be down to join the EU. 64% of them say that they would be cool joining NATO. Yeah, okay, so kick, kick all of the people who might vote no out, and obviously you'll get those results. I mean... Why is he even showing this map of Ukraine? Why is he not showing the independent republics? I mean, if right, right. The, the, the coup in 2014, backed by the West, the Western-backed coup, uh, the the republics, the Donetsk People's Republics and the Lugansk People's Republics, they they were the people, the residents were opposed to that, and I don't know what's what's a greater example of your expression of political will that the West so talks about, that they they expressed their intentions that they want to be independent and they achieved their independence. So why is this why is this guy showing a full map of Ukraine? Yeah, over two million people are going to watch this video and think it's completely, you know, oh, he's got cool graphics. It must be true. I mean, because let's be honest. I mean, that's uh, the, the majority of people see that and they're going to think it's true. I mean, that's how media works. People basically believe uh, what is shown on the media outlets that they like. And over two million people like this guy. And an another thing is that I don't understand this uh, election point he's making because before before uh, the pro-Western people found it necessary to have an armed uprising, the last elected president, Yanukovych, was pro-Russian. This is the thing. Before, before the coup, uh, you... That's when the coup happened. Yeah, because the, because the people who were pro-West didn't want, didn't want to play nice, basically. They, they, Ukraine had a history before uh, the coup happened of basically alternating bef between pro-Western and pro-Russian presidents.
because they were like split 50-50, like, you know, Democrats and Republicans in the United States. But the equivalent to this scenario is basically either the Democrats or the Republicans saying, you know what, we don't want you ever to have a voice in our country anymore, so we're going to kill you, you know? So, so basically, there was, to, um, pre-2014, democracy was functioning in Ukraine. There, there, there was corruption. Corruption is still very high. Democracy yeah. was functioning. Sometimes pro-Western parties came to power. Sometimes pro-Russian parties came to power. But no, the West was not happy with that. They said, no, we're going to make it permanent. But we're going to make you permanently pro-Western. <laughs> yeah, no mention of the referendum in which uh, there was a huge turnout and almost like 98% of people voted in favor. I mean, there's no mention of that. Just like Russian troops invaded. <laughs> you have to read this. On the History of Unity of Russians and Ukrainians by Vladimir Putin, a blog post that kind of sounds like a ninth grade history essay. In this essay, Vladimir Putin argues that Russia and Ukraine are one people. He calls them essentially the same historical and spiritual space. Kind of beautiful writing, honestly. Anyway, he argues that the division between the two countries is due to, quote, a deliberate effort by those forces that have always sought to undermine our unity. And that the formula they use, these outside forces, is a classic one, divide and rule. And then he launches into this super in-depth, like 10 page argument. Okay, uh, is, oof, I don't understand what's wrong with that. He's saying, he's, he's basically praising the article and he's, he's also calling it a ninth group, ninth group, written by a ninth grader. I know. <laughs> he's calling it, it, was it was beautifully written, but he's also calling it, it was written like by, by a silly nine year old. I know, and, and basically everything he's explaining that Vladimir Putin wrote there, and, you know, I'm not like a, a Putin, uh, like a Putin lover, like a Putin fan. I'm not. But everything Putin wrote there pre was pretty spot on, I have to say. I mean, the division between the two countries is due to an, a deliberate effort by forces that have al always sought to undermine the unity of the Ukrainian and the Russian peoples. Who are these forces? The West and Ukrainian fascists. You know, that, that's, that's, as, that's all there is to it, really. I mean, this, this article is historically accurate because Ukraine, as it's known now, was part of the uh, Russian Empire under the, under the Tsar. So, and, and the West, the, 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 the woke people, they, they, they so want this um, historical accuracy. Um, they, 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 they claim that historical accuracy has been, has been removed from the society. For the, the latest example was, was when uh, they showed the queen to be a black person in in the in the, in the series Bridgerton, yeah. I think that's what it's called, and, and people people got crazy over that. No, oh, queen's not black. Queen's not black. I mean, uh, where's the historical accuracy? That was mm. a work of fiction, but these are real facts. I mean, calling Ukraine Ukrainians and Russians as as the same people that's historically accurate. They were part of the same empire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have they have a, a common history. I mean, like he explains in another part of this uh, video that I just skipped over because it was just kind of a historical background. Uh, you know, Russian history also comes from Kiev and Rus. You know, that was the capital of uh, of you know old old Rus, and that was the mutual place where Ukrainians and Russians lived together. This moment at the end of the post that actually kind of hit me in a big way. He says this. Just have a look at Austria and Germany, or the US and Canada. All right, so like, like you said, Nor, so far I haven't heard anything negative about this thing that he said was written by a ninth, <laughs> a ninth grader. How they live next to each other, close in ethnic composition, culture, and in fact sharing one language, they remain sovereign states with their own interests, with their own foreign policy, but this does not prevent them from the closest integration or allied relations. They have very conditional, transparent borders, and when crossing them, citizens feel at home. They create families, study, work, do business. Incidentally, so do millions of those born in Ukraine who now live in Russia. We see them as our own close people. I mean, Listen, like, I, I'm not in support of what Putin is doing, but like that's like a pretty solid, like, 
analogy. It's like a light bulb turned on in his head, though. Let's say if China tried to coax Canada against the United States, yeah, that'd be bad. Yeah, that that's ex that's exactly what's going on here. You know, I kind of get what he means there. There's a deep heritage and connection between these people, and he's seen that falter and dissolve, and he doesn't like it. He clearly, genuinely feels a brotherhood and this deep heritage connection with the people of Ukraine. Okay, 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 Putin, I get it. Your essay is compelling there at the end. You're clearly very smart and well-read. But this does not justify what you've been up to. A ninth grader can write a compelling essay, that's good. Yeah, yeah, they can convince Mr. Johnny here. Okay. It doesn't justify sending 100,000 troops to the border or sending cyber soldiers to sabotage the Ukrainian government or annexing territory, fueling a conflict that has killed tens of thousands of people in eastern Ukraine. No, okay? No matter how much affection you feel for Ukrainian heritage and its connection to Russia, this is not okay. Again, it's like the boyfriend who genuinely loves his girlfriend. They had a great relationship, but they broke up and she's free to see whomever she wants. That is his criticism of the article, that Putin is acting like an abusive ex-boyfriend? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is how like he understands geopolitics, I guess. He compares it to... The thing that kind of bothers me here is that he thinks that this whole situation is like in Putin's head. You know, he thinks like, he thinks this, that the, all the actions that the Russian government takes is just Putin. This is, this is like some weird, uh, like Western liberal understanding of history. It's like the same thing saying like Stalin did everything that happened in the USSR when Stalin was general secretary of the Communist Party. Even though there was an entire state apparatus, an entire Communist Party, an entire Politburo. And also, you know, he doesn't get credit for the good things that happened, only, you know, the purges and the gulags and everything like that. Um, it's like the same thing here. It's like Putin is responsible for all this. The, the, he's, he equates the entire situation, the entire conflict surrounding Ukraine, NATO, all of the, everything in Eastern Europe just has to do with this uh, sort of psychotic episode in Putin's head, I guess. I what know. the hell is wrong I with you? I love you, Jessica. What the hell is wrong with you, dude? Don't fucking touch me. <laughs> I love you, dude. World Star! Putin has constructed his own reality here, one in which Ukraine is actually being controlled by shadowy Western forces who are holding the people of Ukraine hostage. Well, that sounds just about exactly like the, what reality is over there. <laughs> For two things here, I mean, West Ukraine is being controlled by shadowy Western forces. That's, that's just is clear. And, and the, the neo-Nazi organizations that helped the current government get to power, I mean, they're willing collaborators. This is the same, this is the same thing as what happened during World War II, really. I mean, there were people, who, there were people in Ukraine who were super anti-communist and anti-Russia, and there were people who were socialist and had no problem with Russia. And they took different sides in World War II when the Nazis invaded, you know? There were people who collaborated with the Nazis because, you know, they hated Russia, hated socialism, and there were people who uh, supported the Soviet Union. When the Nazis came, they ran into the forests and became partisans and fought for socialism and, the, and their, their country and the Soviet Union, even though it was the hard thing to do. And basically, the lines that divided those people in Ukraine back then are still drawn. This is a kind of repetition of that of this sort of picking sides. I mean, the Donbass region was super pro-Soviet. The Western Ukrainian region uh, was, the regions were not. And that's, uh, that's how it's played out right now. I mean, as for, and, and as for what he said about uh, if, if there was a Russian invasion, which there's not, you know, that Russia's not planning to invade Ukraine. But let's have a hypothetical situation where the Russian military goes into Ukraine and tries to invade it all the way up to Kiev. I promise you, large parts of the population are, are going to welcome them with open arms. I mean, not only the independent people's republics, but also uh, the regions of, like you said, Kharkov and Odessa that are right next to the currently independent people's republics who tried to be independent and were crushed by the Ukrainian military. They're gonna, they would welcome the Russian military. But I can, I can also promise you that 
the West will definitely try to make it the European Afghanistan. Yeah, they're they're already training insurgencies in Ukraine. I mean, because they really think, uh, well, the people, you know, they're listening to what their crazy government is saying, and uh, they believe that there's going to be an, a, Rus a Russian invasion, and they're actually training insurgency forces. Yeah. And even the U.S. government is training Ukrainian special forces on U.S. soil to fight the Russians. It was uh, an investigation that was published in, in Yahoo News that they, where they, they talked to uh, people who you know, were involved in the intelligence community in the United States who, who leaked this, this information. It's crazy. And, and the organizations that are at the forefront of, of training the civilians for, for conflict with Russia are these are these same neo-Nazi organizations? You talk about Azov Battalion. You talk about Pravi Sector, the right sector. And, and I'm not saying this. Don't take my word. Go on YouTube, search the Associated Press channel. They did a story on this, and they call them organizations. They didn't even they don't even call them uh, fascist or far right or neo-Nazi organizations. They just call them normal civilian organizations. Yeah, they can they entirely play down the insane ideologies of these people who just happen to have a common interest in fighting Russia with the United States. Like you said, same thing that happened in Afghanistan. You know, the, the, the US government funded the Mujahideen, R religious fundamentalists, you know, the, the ones who, who are related to the ones who have now come to power in Afghanistan because of America's mistakes there. It's 2022, Putin is showing up to these meetings in Europe to tell them where he stands. He says, NATO, you cannot expand anymore. No new members, and you need to withdraw all your troops from Eastern Europe, my neighborhood. He knows these demands will never be accepted because they're ludicrous, but what he- They're not ludicrous. <laughs> I mean, like we said at the beginning of the video, they were promised that NATO would not move an inch past the Oder River in Europe back in 1990. And another thing is that Another thing I have to mention, because I've been covering this at, uh, at RT ever since these tensions broke out months ago, and I have to say that this guy doesn't understand uh, what's been, what, what the latest developments are in, in how diplomacy has been developing between Russia and the United States, because he's framing this issue as if Russia's just being like, you, you're, I'm saying you're not allowed to have any new people in your military alliance because I don't like it. Because it makes me feel uncomfortable. That's not, that's not the diplomatically, you know, that's not what's actually happening here. The United States is actually violating the Istanbul and Astana declarations that are, uh, that are declarations under the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. You know, an organization that the United States is a part of, Russia is a part of, and European countries are, you know. And these declarations say that while a country can uh, decide to become a member of whatever military alliance it wants, it also has to make sure that when it joins a military alliance, it doesn't infringe on the national security of another sovereign country. This is something that the U.S. Is, and NATO are completely ignoring on purpose. You know, because if they, if they were not ignoring this, then countries like Ukraine and Georgia would not even be considered into this military alliance. What he's doing is showing a false effort to say, well, we tried to negotiate with the West, but they didn't want to. Hence, giving a little bit more justification to a Russian invasion. So, will Russia invade? Is there war coming? Maybe. It's impossible to know because it's all inside of the head of this guy. It's, it's not all inside the head of this guy. It's, uh, it's impossible to know if you, if you if you're just telling yourself an invasion is going to happen without any evidence. Oh, this is like a, a, a metaphysical approach to understanding geopolitics. It's just like ridiculous, you know? It's like this, like, it, it, it's, yeah, really, it's, it's like liberals in the 20th and 21st centuries, modern liberals have for some reason uh, taken this approach to understanding geopolitics that's like based in a, in a psychological approach. You know, they try to understand the psychology of leaders to understand what's going on in the material world, in, in, in diplomacy, in geopolitics, but that's just complete nonsense. <laughs> I mean, you have to examine the, the events that are happening and seeing what are result, how, they're, how they're intertwined, how they're connected, how they contradict each other, not try to guess what psychology Vladimir Putin has. I mean, it, it, he acts like, it, if I was just talking to this guy, I would think, you know, he, 
he was like friends with Vladimir Putin or something, and he had dinner with him, and he was he was thinking, you know, Vladimir Putin was saying some crazy crazy shit, like wanting to go invade Ukraine or something. He, he's got to go see a, a psychologist. But anyway, that's uh, that's basically the end of uh, what we decided to comment on here, because the rest of it is just speculation as to if there's going to be war or not, and just obviously just more speculation. But guys, we didn't. Uh, we didn't sit down and say we should make a series of reaction videos, but we just saw this in our feed and we couldn't go without responding to it because it's just so ridiculous. It's so cringe. And it's just like this guy, Johnny, his presenting style is like, it's so pretentious. It's like effeminate and pretentious. It just cr makes me cringe to watch it. And the fact that he's getting all this stuff wrong just makes it so much worse. So. Anyway, uh, this might. Th th sorry, what were we gonna say, Nor? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, you know how news websites when they publish op-eds, they they write at the they put out a disclaimer at the end that new, new uh, views mentioned, new views mentioned by the author are, are not don't, don't necessarily reflect ours. But I just like to say that views reflected in this video definitely reflect our position. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely our position, the way we've reacted to this video. This 100% reflects our opinions, okay? And uh, I don't know if we're going to do any more reaction videos, uh, but if we see something as ridiculous as this or worse, you can expect more reaction videos. But until then... We'll see you in the next video, and workers of the world, unite. Hey comrades, thanks a lot for watching The Revolution Report. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you can see when we upload new content. As always, we want to give a really special thanks to our comrades on Patreon. First, we have our rank-and-file revolutionaries, Eric, Richard Scott Wigton, Edward, Barry G, and Vutsi Amwala. And as for our general secretaries, we have Dylan Orris. Thank you very much for your support. We appreciate it very much. So everyone, we'll see you in the next video, and workers of the world, unite.